Good morning again. Today's scripture reading is found in Luke 9, verse 11 through 17. But the crowds were aware of this and followed him. And welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get them something to eat. For here we are all in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down to eat in groups of about fifty each. They did so and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were all satisfied. And the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, twelve baskets full. Children are dismissed for junior church. You may be seated. A lot of you here probably know the story of Elizabeth Elliot. In 1953, she and her husband moved to the jungles of South America to try and reach a tribe that had never heard of the gospel before. They had had no contact with the outside world. And uh, you probably know the story, but the, the missionary team of five men that was trying to contact this remote tribe Um, They tried to make some initial contact by plane, by dropping them gifts, and then they tried to make their first in-person contact, and it didn't go well. Um, There was a misunderstanding. Um, This culture was very uh, superstitious. They didn't understand what was going on, and they attacked the five men and speared them to death there on the riverbank um, in the middle of South America. And so Elizabeth Elliot lost her husband when they had only been married for three years, and they had a 10-month-old daughter. Elizabeth Elliot writes about what it was like to return to daily life after losing her husband. Um, She made the decision to stay there as a missionary. And so she, you can just imagine the, the shock, the daily struggle that she was working through as she started to face life without her husband. Um, she started the, tried to keep the work going that they had started there in the jungle. They had recently baptized 50 new believers in that church, and there were no other male missionaries that were there working with them. So she started training two of the men to be pastors, teaching them theology, teaching them how to preach their sermons. Um, She had to figure out how to run the diesel motor that ran the generator for their house. Um, The only way that they got any supplies in the the house where they were at was a a small plane landing on a a little airstrip that they had carved out of the jungle. And if you know anything about that environment, the, the jungle is constantly creeping in, so they had to hire people. Um, It was a team of like 40 people that worked to keep that Uh, to keep that runway clear so that they could still get supplies in. Um, She taught a woman's literacy class each week. She continued the work that she and her husband had started in translating the Gospel of Luke into the language of the natives. She did basic medical work. And then the grass around their house needed to be cut on a regular basis, sometimes a couple of times a week because it grew so fast there in the jungle. Maybe you've had seasons or situations in your life like that. Everything is hard. Nothing seems to be working. You're not exactly sure how you're going to make it through the next day or even the next week. How do we live for Jesus when everyday things are hard? Where do we find the strength to keep going? What do you do when you look at what you need and then you look at what you have and they don't match up. We know what it's like to face situations like what Elizabeth Elliot was faced with there. And it's in fact a very similar situation to what the disciples encounter here in this text this morning. 
This is a well-known story. You've probably heard it before when Jesus feeds the 5,000. What's interesting about this story, especially as Luke gives it to us, is that the crowd is, is barely in view here. I mean, it's the crowd that's getting all the food, but the crowd doesn't ask for the food. The crowd doesn't interact with Jesus. The crowd is just barely mentioned in this account. We know from John that the crowd does eventually find out that Jesus had given out this bread. And so they actually, that actually ends up causing problems because these people decide to start following Jesus just because he gave them bread. But as the gospel writers give us this story, they mainly focus in on the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. Because this account is all about how the disciples are going to encounter the impossible. Jesus is going to show them that he uses the ordinary to do the impossible. Notice that this miracle starts with just an ordinary need. The disciples get back from their missionary journey that they had just been on. They're tired. They need rest. They probably have a lot of stories to share with Jesus. They have questions for Jesus. So they try to get away to a secluded spot where they could have some time away to rest and talk, and it doesn't work. The people find out that they're there. Um, Crowd starts to form as people just probably dropped everything as soon as they heard that Jesus was out there and ran to find them out in this remote location. Um, Matthew and Mark both mention the compassion of Jesus here. Their plans are interrupted. They're inconvenienced. And so Jesus sees these people. He loves them. So he starts teaching them. He starts healing anyone that needs healing. And as the day goes along, there's a real simple problem that comes up, a real basic need. There's no food. The gathering, this gathering that they had, it hadn't been planned. It hadn't been announced. So nobody had thought ahead about this and realized that there was going to need to be food. There's obviously no close towns or villages, and the ones that were the closest were little tiny remote locations, probably just little villages with a couple hundred people in it. So all of a sudden, there's this crowd of thousands of people, and there's no food. Um, They hadn't brought anything with them. There's no place nearby that you could make the food or even buy the food if you had the money. And so the disciples bring this to Jesus' attention. Hey, Jesus, there's a huge crowd here. We're watching the clock for you. It's getting late. It's probably time to send all these people home. Um, This is going to turn out not, you know, this isn't really a great situation. And of course... Like Jesus always does, Jesus surprises us. If Jesus has never surprised you, I'll just say maybe you don't know him. If you've never been surprised by Jesus, you haven't read through the Gospels. Because Jesus does something here that once again leaves the disciples with their jaws on the floor. Because Jesus' answer to them, he turns to them and says, You give them something to eat. What? How how is that even possible, right? You're talking about a crowd of thousands of people. We don't know if the disciples started to get upset. We don't know if they were just in stunned silence. But but you're sitting there thinking, do, do they really, does Jesus not understand how food works? I mean, I'm pretty sure he does, right? We've got five little loaves of bread and two pieces of dried fish. That's not enough barely for the 12 disciples in Jesus. How in the world is that going to be enough for this crowd of thousands that has formed? What is Jesus saying? How could Jesus turn and look them in the eye and say, you give them something to eat? The disciples start kind of trying to like run the numbers for Jesus as if he doesn't understand them. Um, John tells us that it's Philip that kind of like pulls out the calculator and is like, uh, Jesus, I, I, we're not sure what you're not getting here, but there's, there, this isn't going to happen. Um, if we went out and bought food for all these people, Philip tells Jesus it would be 200 denarii, which would be like seven months worth of salary. So you think about whatever your income is over seven months and see if you would either have that on hand, or even if you did have that on hand, would you want it to spend it to cater one meal for a group of strangers? So they're like, Jesus, what, what are you talking about? There's, there's no way. Now, 
Luke is not just giving us some kind of random haphazard conversation here. The Holy Spirit didn't write this down for us just because this is just kind of the smattering of small talk that went on before Jesus did this miracle. There's a specific reason that Jesus turns to the disciples at this moment and looks at them and says, you give them something to eat. What was it? Jesus was bringing them face to face with their need. Jesus is showing these disciples their own insufficiency. The fact is, we are designed as dependent creatures. We're designed to have people around us. We need leaders, friends, caregivers, family. Every day you have physical needs. You need to um, eat and drink. Um, Every day you need to sleep. Um, Every couple of seconds you need to breathe. You can... uh, Pretend like you don't need anything or anybody in this life, but the fact is that as human beings, we are designed as dependent creatures. You can try to hold your breath, you can try not eating or sleeping for a period of time, but it's not going to go well. Jesus uses ordinary need to show his abundance. That's what Jesus is going to do here. Jesus doesn't ignore or minimize the physical needs that the people have in this text. Jesus doesn't sit there and say, they don't need food. Food's not that important. That's not what Jesus says to them. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, you give them something to eat. And our constant needs are constant reminders that we need Jesus. It's part of why we stop on a regular basis in our life and thank God for the things that he gives us, right? Um, we, we stop before a meal and thank God for the food that he's provided because we realize we need food in order to stay alive. Um, when we get a good night's sleep, we should be thanking the Lord for something basic like that. We often don't think about it, but we can thank God even just for breath. The fact that he still continues to give us life. Because every couple of seconds, um, every Every minute of the day, actually, every day, we are dependent on something. And here, this crowd is experiencing an ordinary need, and Jesus cares about it. But notice again that this whole story is focused on the disciples. It's not just a need that they have for themselves, right? It's not just that the disciples are like, hey, we're hungry, we need something to eat. The disciples are really overwhelmed with the need of the crowd here. They are seeing this this need get multiplied by thousands, and they're getting overwhelmed with the idea of how could they possibly meet this need? How could they possibly fix this situation? It's pretty obvious what the need is. They pointed out to Jesus, hey, Jesus, there's not enough food. we got to send the people home. There's nothing we can do here. But Jesus turns and looks at them and says, you give them something to eat. If you try to help people, if you sign up to serve with Jesus, you're going to be confronted with massive need around you that you can't fix. Sometimes there's too many people with the same need. Sometimes there's people with needs that go so deep there's nothing that you can do. But Jesus is still looking at us and saying, you give them something to eat. And we look at Jesus in that situation and say, are you serious? Like, even if I could marshal all of my possible resources here, it's still not going to be enough to, to meet this need. But part of being a follower of Jesus is learning to take our needs to Jesus. That's part of, of what they're learning here. The disciples are starting to see this, that they need to take their ordinary, regular, everyday needs to Jesus. They don't approach Jesus that way of, hey, Jesus, can you do something here? Hey, Jesus, we need your help. They approach the situation of, we got this, Jesus. We know what to do. These people got to go. Let's let's get it going here. Let's, Let's start making the announcements. But Jesus is pointing at them. In life, in serving Jesus, he is kindly and firmly leading us into situations that we cannot handle. In situations that we don't have what it takes we come to the conclusion that we can't meet all the needs in our neighborhood. We can't meet all the needs in church. We can't meet all the needs in our family. 
And there's a part of us that then says, yeah, exactly. Great. So let's just wash. I'm, I'm done, right? I, can't, I just wash my hands of it. I can't help the situation. It's all right. I'm out. I'm done. Send everybody home. It's it. But Jesus doesn't let us off the hook. Jesus looks at us in the eye and kindly but firmly and says, you do something. Jesus is going to show off his abundance, his sufficiency, not ours. But it doesn't mean that we just step back and don't do anything. That's what he did here with, um, with Elizabeth Elliot and the situation that she was in. She's basically overwhelmed with all of the needs around her, right? She's facing the need of being a widow, the need of being a single mom, the need of doing mission work in a very remote loca- location with being surrounded by people that have all sorts of needs. So how did she go on? Well, the second thing here in our text this morning shows us. Jesus uses ordinary needs to show his abundance. But the other thing that Jesus uses is ordinary obedience. We've already seen in these verses, and we're seeing as you, as you read through this story, the focus is on Jesus and his disciples. The crowd is just kind of out of focus in the background. And the disciples and Jesus are having this conversation And as you go through the story, it changes from being confronted with an ordinary need of, hey, there's all this food that needs to be, uh, that we need to find somehow, to ordinary obedience. So the next thing that Jesus has the disciples do after he says, you give them something to eat, is he says, organize everybody for the meal. Have everybody sit down in in groups of 50 because it's time to eat. Can you imagine being told by Jesus, hey, get everybody ready, let everybody know it's dinner time. And you're sitting there thinking, what what dinner? There's no food here. All they've got is just these five loaves of bread and two fish. Probably barley loaves. The fish would have been dried. There's one random kid we find out from one of the other gospel writers that actually the disciples didn't even remember to bring lunch that day. A little boy showed up with the lunch, and so we know probably his mom packed it, right? Not, probably, he probably didn't think of it. But this is all they got, five loaves and two fishes. Maybe they were probably hoping that would be enough for them and Jesus. And now Jesus is like, it's dinner time. Let all of these thousands of people here, just have them sit down, let them know we're getting ready to eat. And the disciples, what do they do? They obey. They listen to Jesus. If we had been there, we probably would have started to say, Jesus, no, 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 we can't tell them that. There's no food here. What are you talking about? If we tell everybody it's dinner time and there's no food here, they're going to be mad. They're going to think we've lost it. No, 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 Jesus, shh, shh. But what do the disciples do? They listen. They obey. Ordinary obedience Then, the next thing that happens is Jesus thanks his heavenly Father for the meal. But I have a feeling that the disciples always remembered this prayer because Jesus is giving thanks for food that doesn't exist. Can you imagine if you got invited over to a friend's house or a family member's house? You get invited over for dinner and you walk into the house and you don't smell any food cooking? The the kitchen is bare there's no nothing on the stove there's no dishes out and you're sitting there thinking like i thought they invited us over for dinner you know you're hoping something's in the fridge you know maybe they ordered something it's still coming maybe it's in the oven and you just can't see it and they say oh time for dinner let's sit down and they're like oh, let's thank the lord for the food i mean that, at that point if it's somebody you know you'd be like what food you know what are we thanking the lord for here you know or what are we eating but But in this situation, this is food for thousands of people. If you add women and children into this crowd, they say it probably between 10 to 20,000 people. You can't hide food for 10 to 20,000 people. It's either there or it's not. And Jesus tells the disciples, let's give thanks to the Lord for this food that we're about to eat. The disciples had to be thinking, what food, Jesus? There's only the five loaves and two fish. Like, did he not get that? Like, what is he missing here? How are we thanking the Lord for the food that isn't here yet? You'd start to be getting nervous. But what do the disciples do? They obey. 
They pray with Jesus. Isn't that what all prayer is? Praying for something that we can't see yet. And they pray with the Lord, and then Jesus starts breaking up the food. There's no, this is how they would have served the food back then. I mean, there was no paper plates. There was no sharp knives, you know, to cut it in pretty slices like we're used to. This is how they would serve food back then. You just break it up and pass it out to everybody, especially in a remote location like this. There's no tables. So Jesus just starts breaking it up and telling them, all right, hand this out. Once again, he uses the disciples to do it. These details that are in this account aren't just here by accident. It's not just some random assortment of things that happened. It's very specific. Jesus takes the bread, he breaks it, and he hands it to the disciples, and it's the disciples that hand it out. Can you imagine taking your first load of, of bread and fish and handing it out to the first couple of people, the first group of 50 that you were assigned to? And you're thinking, Man, those people in the back are going to be mad. <laughs> you know, there's no way by the time I get back to Jesus, all the food's going to be gone. This is going to be a disaster. There's, the, the text actually doesn't even tell us where exactly the bread gets multiplied. Um, some, some, uh, there's been a debate in the church history about was it multiplied in the hands of Jesus or was it multiplied in the hands of the disciples? The text doesn't even tell us. It's just that as Jesus passes it out, there was plenty there. He keeps breaking it. He keeps handing it out. And, and a little bit like when Jesus turned the water into wine, Jesus doesn't announce, hey, I'm doing a big miracle here. I want to let everybody know the bread's getting handed out. Jesus just, just does it. And really, it's the disciples that knew how much food there was that they started with. This was a miracle that Jesus did exactly for them. But their response and the way that this story is given to us is in simple, ordinary obedience. Jesus says, tell everybody to sit down. The disciples do it. They don't argue with Jesus. They don't say, no, 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 that doesn't make sense. Jesus says, let's pray. The disciples pray. We might have been te tempted to, you know, dip out during the prayer, you know. But Jesus prays. They pray with him. Jesus says, here, here, take some food. Go start passing it out. And they do it. It's fascinating to me how ordinary all of this is. It was an ordinary lunch, ordinary food. They have the crowd sit down the regular way that they would for a meal. Jesus gives the normal blessing like they would always do it. He distributes the food in the usual way, and he uses regular disciples that are there to do it. Basically, everything about this miracle is ordinary, except for the fact that thousands of people are fed. Supernatural supply. More than enough. A crowd of thousands eats and eats until they're full. And when they're done, there's 12 baskets of food left over. Overabundance. In the Old Testament, God rained down manna for his people in the wilderness. But they were only supposed to take just the exact amount that they needed. You weren't supposed to keep any left over. And there was always just the right amount. But here, Jesus comes, he provides bread, and, and there's bread for days. They basically had as much leftovers as they could carry. Why? Because ordinary need and ordinary obedience met the extraordinary power of Jesus. Jesus does what only Jesus can do. Regular need, regular obedience, but it's in the presence of Jesus, and there's supernatural results that impact thousands. Remember where we left Elizabeth Elliot stepping back into her house and parenthood and ministry for the first time without her husband. She describes it like this. She said, you can imagine, um, you can imagine how tempted I was to just plunk myself down and say, there is no way I can do this. I wanted to sink into despair and helplessness. But she said that what got her through this time was an old poem from the late 1800s that the title was called, Do the Next Thing. It goes like this, many a questioning, many a fear, many a doubt has his quieting here, moment by moment let down from heaven, time, opportunity, and guidance are given. Fear not tomorrow, child of the king, Trust them with Jesus 
Do the next thing. Do it immediately. Do it with prayer. Do it reliantly, casting all care. Do it with reverence, tracing his hand, who placed it before thee with earnest command. Stayed on omnipotence, safe neath his wing. Leave all results. Do the next thing. Looking for Jesus ever serener, working or suffering be thy demeanor. In his dear presence, the rest of his calm, the light of his countenance be thy psalm. Strong in his faithfulness, praise and sing. Then, as he beckons thee, do the next thing. Elizabeth Elliot credits those four words, do the next thing, with what carried her through those incredibly difficult years of missions work, housework, and single parenting. Do the next thing is just another way of saying ordinary obedience. No grand gestures, no huge, magnificent thing in front of thousands, but just simple, regular, everyday obedience. If Jesus wanted to, when he did this miracle, he could have very easily said, voila, or some magical sounding word, and all of a sudden, all the food was there for all the people. And then they could have passed it out, right? But he doesn't do that. Jesus could have made this big grand gesture with his hands, and all of a sudden, there was a loaf of bread and a piece of fish in front of each person. But he doesn't do that. What does Jesus do? Jesus chose to work the most amazing miracle through ordinary obedience of his people. They just listened to what Jesus said to do. They just did the very next little thing that he had asked them to do, and that's how Jesus worked. In life, in serving Jesus, there's a lot of times that we toggle back and forth between despair and self-sufficiency. We have uh, this self-sufficient pride where we see a need, and uh, if we had been there that day, we would have been out there buying flour and baking bread, and we're like, we can feed all these people, right? And we have that self-sufficiency in us. And then typically, we try that for a while, and we get burnt out. And we say, oh, there's no way I can do that. It's too much. There's no way. And then we go over to this despair of, what's the point? Send all the people home. Give it up. We're done. This isn't going to happen. But Jesus, right down the middle, says, you do something. And we look at what we have, and we look at what the need is, and we say, impossible. No way. It doesn't make any difference if I try. But Jesus says, you do something. If you want to experience supernatural abundance... All you need is ordinary need and ordinary obedience. You just have to take what you do have and place it into Jesus' hands. That's where the miracles start. Maybe you won't actually see the miracle because you're so busy handing out the bread. You might be tempted to think, but this is all I have. This is what I have to grab on to. This little bit of time, this little bit of resources, this little thing, I have to have, if I give this to Jesus, no way, it's going to get, it's going to get taken, it's going to get ruined. But Jesus is good. What we place in his hands gets multiplied. You obey, you do the next right thing. Our text this morning is the one miracle in all four Gospels that is included in all four Gospels. If you count the resurrection as a miracle, then that's in all four too. But the one miracle that Jesus does that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record in detail is this miracle. Um, the, uh, the, the, the size of the crowd, the amount of the loaves and fishes, Jesus praying beforehand, this conversation that takes place, all four of them include it. And if you think about that for a second, it seems like an unusual miracle for them to highlight. A lot of uh, commentators actually say that this is the climax of Jesus' ministry in all four Gospels. This is the high point of everything that Jesus does. Because you think, there's some, uh, there kind of seems to be more dramatic things that Jesus did, right? As far as like, Jesus raised people from the dead. That, that would seem, that's impossible, right? That's a bigger one. Um, Jesus uh, calmed a storm just with a word. 
Um, Jesus cast out demons that there were thousands of demons inside of a guy and he just threw them out. We would think of that about that as a more dramatic, more climactic miracle. But why did the gospel writers all include this one and make it a centerpiece of Jesus's ministry? I believe it's because this is a model for how we live the whole Christian life. We experience our needs and we bring them to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I, I don't know what to do. I, 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 don't, I don't know what we can do, but can you do something? And we come to Jesus with our lunch, our little lunch that isn't going to be enough. And we hand it to Jesus and we obey in the regular everyday things he tells us to do. And there is a, a supernatural multiplication that comes out of that. It's a model for how we live the whole Christian life. It's walking by faith and not by sight. Your ordinary obedience in the hands of Jesus is going to impact thousands. A lot of times we don't see it, but it does. Let me just give you a couple of examples, and we could be here all day with these, but I'll, I'll just give you some ones that I thought of. We take an offering every time in our service. It's just an offering. Um, there's a box in the back. You can put something in there if you want to. But what happens to the, some of that money is that it gets sent all around the world to spread the gospel. You don't get to see it. You don't get to, today, you don't get to see a missionary in, in Spain or a missionary in Hong Kong who's there giving the gospel to somebody who's never heard it before. But as the Lord enables you and you put money in the offering plate, God takes that faithful, quiet obedience and he uses it to spread the gospel all over the world. I, I think about the people who so faithfully help with the shepherd group food each, each week. Um, it it increases because we're all sitting there praying and hoping that the food we're smelling during the service is for our shepherd group. Um, and you're, you're just hoping that's got to be my group. But, but somebody that takes the time to do that, think about all the people that that impacts. The people that, maybe a visitor that gets to come. There's people that come to our shepherd groups who aren't able to cook meals and help bring a lot of food. But the people that, that come to that and get to share in a meal, it's a, it's a special thing. It's a wonderful thing that we get to do together. That, that that impacts people and the whole rest of their day, the whole rest of their life. Because they got to sit around and eat a meal with other Christians. This is certainly an appropriate uh, message for mothers, but really for all parents. The, the faithful, ordinary things that you do on an everyday basis, it's going to impact the whole life of your child. And it's just ordinary, regular, everyday things that you're doing of changing diapers and cleaning the house and being an example to them and teaching them the word. All these different little things that it, by itself, it doesn't seem like it's a huge thing, but when it's in the hands of Jesus, it gets multiplied and impacts a life that's going to last thousands of days and eventually for all of eternity with the people around you that you impact. Jesus tells us to pray. Jesus tells us to pray with other believers. Jesus tells us to pray for other believers. And most of the time when it comes to the point in your day where you need to be praying, you're thinking, do I really need to obey here? It's, it's just an ordinary thing. It doesn't really seem like much is happening as soon as I pray, like all of a sudden all these things are taken care of. Is Jesus really going to do anything with it? But what does Jesus do with our prayers? Jesus takes our prayers and he works them. And we are going to find out in eternity all of the ways that Jesus answered those prayers. The list goes on and on. Some days just getting out of bed is simple obedience to Jesus. Some days coming to church is just simple obedience to Jesus. But Jesus uses ordinary blessings, ordinary obedience, in extraordinary ways. It also means that if Jesus uses ordinary obedience... It means that disobedience is always taking us away from his abundance. One of our problems that we struggle with in the Christian life is disobedience. 
There's things in our life that we're doing that we know that don't please God, and we keep doing it because we say, what's the point? What's the point of obeying here, Jesus? It's not going to make any difference in the situation. It's not going to make any difference in my life, really. So what's the big deal? Obedience is hard. It's hard to obey. It's hard to do the things that Jesus calls us to do. We can say that it's little or we say that, oh, oh, you should just obey, but it's hard to obey Jesus in some of the things that he tells us to do. If you have a whole life that's filled with disobedience, it might be because you're not his follower. If The very first time we come to Jesus, it's because we see that we're a sinner and that we need him to help us. We come to him with empty hands and, and we give our lives to him and say, I'm going to obey you. Um, because of all the things that you've done for me, I'm, I'm going to live for you now. But then as Christians, sometimes we start to tolerate disobedience in our life because we've forgotten what it means to be a disciple. And we can't excuse disobedience in our life just because we don't see how it's all going to work out. That's part of what this miracle is teaching us, that we just need to obey and then we put, these, we put what we do have into the hands of Jesus, and we let him work. We let him do what he's going to do. I'm sure most of you know that the rest of Elizabeth Elliot's life was met with great blessing, um, that she actually got to share Christ with some of the men who murdered her husband and, and share the gospel with them. She ended up becoming a writer and a speaker that impacted thousands but it started with ordinary obedience and changing diapers and mowing the lawn and fixing a diesel engine and teaching a class. In your life, in your day, do the next right thing. Do the next right thing. There's ordinary obedience in the Christian life, but there is no insignificant obedience. This morning, Jesus is calling you to obey in a certain area of your life. We rely on on you listening and thinking and rely on the Holy Spirit for you to determine what that is. But what is Jesus calling you to obey this morning? What is he asking of you? Because really, there are no ordinary lunches in Jesus' hands, right? Right? Everything we do in the Christian life is really just coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, it doesn't look like much, but here it is. It's yours, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. If it's a a family thing, if it's just your daily routine, if it's your job and going to work, if it's the things he's called you to do here at church, um, whatever it is that he's called you to do, we, we don't try to pretend like we can show up and do everything But on the other side, we can't just sit back and say there's nothing to do. There's right in the middle where Jesus is showing us ordinary need, ordinary obedience, and you place it into the presence of Jesus, and you let him take care of the rest. And he's great, and he's good, and that's where we experience his abundance. Hudson Taylor said, a little thing is a little thing, but faithfulness in little things is a great thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this reminder this morning of your power. Lord, we thank you that your power can help us and meet us in our ordinary, regular, everyday needs. And Lord, that brings our hearts comfort because we have a lot of need. And we're surrounded with people that have a lot of needs. And we're thankful that you care about those. And that as we come into your presence, you help us with those. Heavenly Father, we want to ask your forgiveness for the times and the ways that we've been disobedient to you. We found different ways to excuse it and justify it. And we've somehow convinced ourselves that obedience to you is not really going to work out. But we've been wrong every single time. And Lord, please forgive us for that. Lord, give us a a diligence in obeying you, even in the little things that you ask us to do, because we want to experience your abundance. We want to be close to you, and we've seen what you can do with ordinary obedience. So, Lord, come 
work in our hearts. Draw us closer to you as we walk with you this week, I pray. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turning your blue hymnals to number 448, day by day. And let's stand as we close with day by day. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would pay